So the search continues for a mini sub that disappeared on a trip to view the wreckage of the Titanic. Five people are on board. The Coast Guard in Boston says that the sub lost contact Sunday, about an hour and 45 minutes into its dive. So for more on the missing uh, submersible uh, and rescue efforts, we want to bring in Butch Hendrick. He's joining us now. He's the president and founder of Lifeguard Systems, which conducts dive training for public safety officers. And he's not involved in this specific rescue, though, but has been instructing uh, dive rescues for over 35 years. So we sort of have been loosely calling this a submarine, but it's not a submarine. It's a submersible. It needs to sort of, you get, once it's in the water, it can navigate, but it's not sort of independently able to propel itself kind of around, right? I, yeah. I hope I'm saying it properly. This seems like an incredible complex rescue because they don't even know, to start things <laughs> off, they don't know if this submersible is under the water or on top of the water. Yeah, it's going to be difficult because, yes, we know that it entered the water at a given time. We know that it had a basic life support system for 96 hours. And we know its project was to go to the bottom at 12,500 feet to be at the Titanic. Not approximately 90 minutes after its launch, entering the water, it lost communication. It's very possible that by that period of time, it was already on the bottom, getting ready to view the Titanic, mm. and it could have gotten itself entangled somewhere. Entangled, it's possible that its communication antenna was dislodged, broken, and they lost communication, and that they would still be reasonably possibly with another 40 hours of life support based on the information given. The, the, the other scenario, which was uh, put forth by uh, a CBS Sunday Morning correspondent, David Pogue, who actually uh, was in that submersible uh, a few years ago doing a story, is uh, that something horribly uh, went horribly wrong there it was an infrastructure issue with the craft itself. Um, and as you know, the pressures at that at those depths are incredible. In fact, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, most most military type submarines uh, generally don't dive any deeper than uh, than uh, 1500 uh, feet. We're talking about uh, almost 12,000 feet. I think mm -hmm. that the Titanic is at the bottom of, of the ocean there. And this might have happened at 9,000 feet, which I think is where they lost communications. With this, at 9,000 feet, I can't imagine the pressure on, uh, uh, on the submersible there. And so it could have imploded. It could have, it could have imploded. More likely, it could have leaked and flooded. Right? One of the things to kind of keep in mind, we see vehicles automobiles that go in the water all the time on the news. A vehicle that goes in the water near shore is in 10 feet of water. That pressure differential over surface pressure is about five pounds per square inch, and you cannot open the doors. The pressure is so great, we can't open a door until the water floods the interior. This, at 12,000 feet, it's 5,000 PSI greater than surface pressure. Mm. So the pressure of its, its own pressure, there's no re opening a gate, there's no opening a window, there's no making an interactive lock. What we do look at is if it had a small leak, it's possible that the electrical system has been affected. And if that happened, then it may be again that they could still be alive, interior, and breathing and hoping for someone to come and get them. Now, it, it, sorry, the other thing that we mentioned is that they still are sort of trying to determine if perhaps it's on the surface. This has submersible has several mechanisms to propel itself up to the surface. Um, and when I first heard that, I thought, and the other thing is they can't get out. Even if they're on the surface, they can't get out because it's bolted shut from the outside. So it's important to find them. But I thought to myself, well, if it's on the surface, can't you just fly over? I mean, why can't they just visually see whether or not it's on the surface? Could weather conditions be making it difficult? Well, it's also the side, the surface area that they're searching it's is the massive. size of Connecticut or, or the country of Ireland, is right. what I understand. But you would have a, yeah. a ballpark area of where they would be headed at least, right? It, I mean, what would, what would make it difficult to identify them on the surface? Well, right now, as I understand it, the winds are moving between 28 and 30 miles an hour. Mm. The sea is anything from, a, from two to three foot high with white caps. So it could be difficult, but you are looking at the individuals 
the Coast Guard, United States, Canada, et cetera, that are out there, they're tr trained on how to see this. They're flying fixed wings aircraft. They're, they're able to fly a hundred miles square without and in no time whatsoever. We are looking at the potential that if it drifted in current, it could be several hundred miles from where it entered the water. But again, looking at a fixed wing aircraft and the highly trained personnel that are in those aircraft searching, they know how to look for this. They'll be look, looking for any, they've also got equipment on deck that'll allow them to suddenly realize there's something on the surface besides the visual eye. Most likely it's not at the surface. Mm -hmm. Most likely it's subsurface. And we'd like to think that it, they still have 40 hours of life support. So being positive, and I'm sure that that's what our, our Coast Guards and Canadians are doing, is telling their crew, we still have approximately 35 to 40 hours of life support. We still, this is still a potential rescue. Keeping it positive will keep the crew at all levels working hard. As soon as we go to, well, we're not gonna find it, it's over. The whole potential of the morale drops. When morale drops, we lose a whole massive part of that rescue. And again, you have to say that the Coast Guard, that's what they train for. They know how to keep their crew positive right up until they realize it's no longer a capability. Can we talk about, and understanding that we know nothing at all about this, but what kind of, I guess, math and science goes into trying to calculate based on conditions, based on the, the, the water, based on the, the weather, yes. given that this, this uh, craft does not propel itself, what kind of calculations go into trying to find something that is drifting in water? I mean, uh, human, human beings from the very beginnings of, our, of, of civilization have been able to navigate the ocean surface um, yes. using math and science. And I wonder yes. what kind of math yeah. and science goes into trying to figure out things underwater. First of all, this unit cannot travel like that we think of a boat or a vessel that can move across the surface, but it does have mobility. It has the ability to rotate, rise and fall in the water column. It has, if you will, it has the ability to do minor motions with small motors. It just can't propel itself quickly in the ocean. When we start to look at current, the moment I think of a one knot current moves at 100 foot per minute. Mm. So if it's caught in a current that's running at six to eight knots, it's moving six to 800 foot per minute. Wow. The wow. Coast Guard knows that. The Coast Guard has already put out their own beacons what would have helped is if the submersible had had releasable transmitters that could have come to the surface and the moment they realized we were in trouble, the trackers could have said, okay, this unit came to the surface here, here's what the current and wind have been doing. The Coast Guard would have put their own trackers in, retraced it, and been able to start to follow its, its travel point. So if it's drifting midwater, in the current, they know how to track speed. They'll do what's called fetch and track. They'll be tracking it based on currents, winds. They'll have a general idea, general, within 100 square miles of where it should be. And then they will narrow it down from there. That seems like a basic safety measure. So I'm going to ask you a question that you may not be able to answer because I understand, like, you know, you, you don't know. We're all learning about You're this company. Fine. But, I mean, based on what we're learning so far, would you have gotten into this submersive? You don't no. have to answer, but I'm curious. No, I would not. But one of the things that I do believe is important and we understand, if you had gone on this trip, you would not be just put into this submersible and now we're going for a ride. You would have been shown. You would have been shown how to use some of the emergency processing inside the unit. So, if there's pieces that it's not one person trying to control everything, you'd have probably spent multiple hours learning how to do little pieces that would make it safer for you. The concept that it does not have releasable tracking buoys, it does not have a backup 
transmitter that would allow you to emergency, no matter what happened, it would be able to put out its own underwater signal that the Coast Guard and our Navy could find. And as you said earlier, our general submarines are not designed to go to this depth. There's not another unit sitting 700 miles away that can come out here and go save them. When we're looking at putting another unit down to search, we're most likely looking at a unmanned rover. Mm. It's a basically, it'll be more likely controlled like a Pac-Man. It'll have cameras, it'll have manipulating arms that can be, different tools can be attached. They could have cutting tools, grabbing tools, and so forth. But you can see where she's moving along the surface quietly. Then when she descends, the submersible has the ability to maneuver, turn. You see little fans going there. Those are actual motors. And very often, those would be on the front of a large ship to help it dock. So it's very quietly in motion. But the Ender, I'm sorry, the Titanic has so much debris across it that the, the thought of it being entangled, it's caught on something and can't get itself out is extremely high. Mm. The second the second thought, as you've already mentioned, is did it have a, a leak? Is water come into it, destroyed the, or damaged the electrical system? It can't communicate. It can't do what it's supposed to right. do. Uh, uh, Butch, mm -hmm. Hendrick, thank you so much uh, for your expertise. We appreciate it. And I thought you'd ask great questions for people who don't know the system. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Butch.